So welcome back to the sawmill, friends. It's Saturday, and it looks like it's gonna be another hot one here in Tennessee. Now I gotta go mow the yard, but while I'm doing that, you guys check out this drone footage and look at our metal roof. They finally finished up about two days ago. I think it looks pretty good. Friends, that didn't take too long. It took me about two hours, maybe. I still need to go back and weed eat, but I'll do that later when the sun goes down. Next on the list for today is to go check on the kiln. So inside the kiln is about 2,000 board feet of four quarter white oak, and most of it's quarter sawn. Now this lumber, most of it was sawed over a year ago. And I talked about this in my last video. If you didn't see that, go check it out. The moisture content was around 16% on most of the lumber in here and it's been going now for six days. So I got the Delmhurst meter, I hooked it up to this system and we'll see what the moisture content is today. All right guys, we got our Delmhurst moisture meter hooked up to this system. Now this right here, friends, is my opinion, the best moisture meter on the market. I'm not sponsored by them, I bought this with my own money about maybe five or six years ago. It's expensive, but if you're into saw milling, you need to know what your moisture is on your lumber and this right here is the most accurate meter I think there is. You can get it on Amazon. There's a link down below if you want to go check that out. Once again, not sponsored by Delmhurst, guys. I'm just letting you all know this right here is the best meter in my opinion. So right now, we got four sample boards inside the kiln. Got my temperature set at 120. You gotta set your temperature on your meter to the uh, environment inside the kiln. That way you get a good accurate reading. So you bring up your meter, you hit the button, negative 4.6. Well, that means the lumber is, my goodness, friends. Looky there. See that? That's where this goes. My goodness, professional YouTuber right here making a mistake. First time ever, I'll tell you what. All right, let me try this again. The meter is hooked up. I've got my list up here, my dial indicator. Let me tilt the camera up, it shows all of our sample boards. I have four boards with pins in them. So the first reading we're gonna get is on number one and we're checking the shell, which is the outer layer of the lumber. What's it say right there? I'm trying to look through the camera guys. 7.8 on the shell. Let's check the core on the same piece of lumber right there. 8%. That's what you wanna see right there, friends. That's a good reading. Now number three, I'm gonna switch down to it. Yesterday, it was reading a little bit higher than everybody else, so let's check that. This is number three on the core. 11.2. Let's check out number four real fast. Number four with the core reading, 10.9. So number four, let's check out shell, 10. Okay, so number four is gonna get there. It just needs to dry a little bit longer. Well, common question I get on this channel, how long does it take to kill and dry wood? Well, this lumber has been in my kiln for six days and come on now, I want you fasten. I'm on YouTube here, come on, work with me. There we go. So this stuff's been in the kiln for less than a week and it's almost dry. And most of it is dry enough to sterilize at this point. I'll probably wait until Monday and make sure I can get those other two sample boards down to at least 9% because when you sterilize, that's when you crank up the temperature in the kiln to 150 degrees and you hold it there for 24 hours. And what's that do? It heats up the core of your lumber to 133 degrees, which is the required temperature to kill all the buds that may be present in your lumber. 
So if your lumber is around 9%, 9.5%, maybe even 10%, and you go into sterilization mode, it usually brings it down another percent because it heats it up so hot and gets a lot of that moisture out of your lumber. So that's something to always consider if you're killing drying wood. If you're stuck around 9 or 10% and you're having a lot of issues, sometimes you can go ahead and sterilize your lumber at 150 and get it down to 8 or 7. And something else you could do, if you are having trouble with moisture holding on to your lumber, or your lumber holding on to moisture, let me say that right this time. After you sterilize your lumber, you come down here and you leave the kiln running, but you cut off the heat, and you turn on your exhaust fan, so all that extra moisture that came out of the lumber during sterilization will exit the kiln and not get reabsorbed by the lumber. I hope that was clear. Because all that moisture that's left in the air during sterilization, there's nowhere for it to go because this kiln is airtight. So if you just let it set, that moisture is gonna be reabsorbed by the lumber. It's gonna to go to the moisture content pretty close to what it started with. So if it's 10%, you sterilize, you might get it down to eight or nine, but you wanna get rid of that moisture at the very end to make sure your lumber doesn't reabsorb it. Now, if you sterilize at 8% or 7% or 6%, you don't have to worry about that so much. You can go ahead and turn your kiln off, turn all the fans off and let your kiln set, in my opinion, for about two days and let it kind of calm down and rest. That lumber has been through a traumatic experience with all this heat and all this air being forced through it. And at the end of the cycle, if you can let it set for 24 to 48 hours and let it cool down on its own and kind of relax, I think it makes the lumber better when it comes out of the kiln. The current temperature inside the kiln 120 degrees and my compressor just kicked on. I got the compressor set at 98. So when the wet bulb, which is a sensor inside the kiln reaches 98, the compressor turns on and it takes a lot of the moisture out of the air and condenses it in the compressor and it sends it out of a tube out of the back of the kiln that goes into a five gallon bucket. I collect all the water coming out of my kiln, not because I reuse it, but because I want to come back here after all night of this thing running and I can pick up that five gallon bucket and see how much water's in it. It's very important. You got data coming in from a kiln from a lot of different places. The moisture meter readings, the water coming out of the back, and all the numbers on this screen. You gotta pay attention to all that when you dry wood. You can't just come down here and cut this thing on and forget about it. You're gonna mess things up if you do that. There's a lot going on with these kilns, friends. There's a lot going on. I like what I'm seeing right now, so we're gonna leave this alone. I say Monday, we'll come down here and turn the sterilization on. Probably Monday morning. I could probably do it tomorrow, but I think I'm gonna let it run for two more days before we do it. Looks like we got some company. The neighbor's guinea hens are down here with us. They usually come out eh, maybe two or three times a day and follow me around. They say they eat ticks, so therefore they can come here anytime. Hello, girls or boys. I don't know if you're girls or boys. I'm not sure what you are. We're gonna call you girls and leave it at that. All right, guys, next up on the list is getting the 754 and get rid of these logs. Red oak, poplar, and a hickory. And these are ate up with carpenter ants. And I think I saw some termites in the hickory log back here. So we need to get these things, take them up to the burn pile. And I think I'll go ahead today since I'm working out here close to the burn pile and light it up. They've been on the ground way too long. See if we can get this started. It's still pretty wet down here. It rained yesterday. I think I'll grab these two saw horses and get rid of them. My buddy Brad built these for me, I think about five years ago, right when we first moved here. And I have gotten my use out of them, I tell you that. I really appreciate him doing that. And if he's watching, as you can see, Brad, I'm gonna need us some new ones. So uh, I'm just aggravating everybody. I need to build some of these. They've worked out really good over the years, but they're ready to go to the burn pile. and give these saw horses a proper Viking send-off into the fire. Nice slow fire today, that's what I like.
Now let's go grab some of those rotten logs. Now this first one here, I probably should have cut it in half, but too late now. I get a better grip on that one. There we go. That's a lot better. I'll be right back. I'll tell you what, I am glad I have a cab tractor today. It is 95 degrees out here. Hot day in Tennessee. Let's grab this poplar. light compared to that oak. I'll be right back. We'll grab this last one then I can get in here with my mower and clean up this mess. I got weeds growing everywhere down here. guys we've got a pretty good fire going now these logs are probably burned for about 24 hours maybe longer let's throw this one on top here and get out of dodge keep it from rolling off looky there professional youtuber guys i never make mistakes huh. i'm gonna go grab about two little uh, rounds that are down here in the weeds and toss them on here also all right guys that fire is burning pretty good that will probably burn for the next few days that's one thing about these big old rotten logs when you put them on your burn pile they smoke and smolder for a couple of days but you get rid of them that way and that's good can't do firewood out of those because of all those carpenter ants. That would be a mess right there. Because if you cut them for firewood and split them up, the ants will stay in them. And you stack them beside your shop. And the next thing you know, your shop gets infested or your house with carpenter ants. I've seen it happen, guys. It's happened to me before. So uh, that's why I don't do that. Now we're going to head up here to the house and get the truck and bring some metal down here to the timber frame. Alright guys, so since the last time you all were in the workshop, I think it was maybe three videos back, I can't remember. I got a few things done and I changed some stuff. Let me show you. So the first big change is the location of the Grizzly 20 inch planer. I did have it over there next to that post beside of the dust collector. That's my Harbor Freight dust collector. It does a really good job, friends, but when you're running a 20 inch planer, that badge fills up really fast and you find yourself emptying that badge several times a day. So here's what we came up with. I moved the planer in the middle of this room. This part of the timber frame is 16 by 30 right here in the middle. But as you can see, there's nothing hooked up to the dust collector. So right here, friends, is the dust collector for the four-sided molder right there. It's got four hoses going to it three of them are permanently attached to this machine and the fourth one is on a quick connect right here at the front you can pop that right off and i use this one right here for the 20 inch jointer now the jointer got moved in here as well that's another change that we made i'll talk about that here in a minute but that quick connect right there is what i'm using on the planer now let me show you how it works now there's a lot of wood shops out there friends they have a dedicated hose going to every machine and that would be nice. You just walked up to the machine and turn it on. But based on my layout in here, it's really not possible, especially since I use this dust collector right here now for the planer and the jointer both. And the reason this thing right here is so valuable, there's no bags to change out. There's nothing to do. 
the chips go out of the building, out there on the ground, when I get a decent pile of them, I either take them to the garden, to the chicken house, or I burn them. There's no labor involved. There's no changing out bags or nothing like that. And I'm able to utilize this really nice dust collector on all my major machines in the shop and not have to have more than one collector with the exception of the Harbor Freight dust collector and that just goes to the table saw. So this is how fast it goes, friends. Once I set up the planer, I come in here, take it off. Once I do that, I walk in here to the planer, which is only about 10 feet away. I make this connection. And once I make this connection, which just takes a second, I make sure this handle is out of the way of this clearance right here on the table of the planer. You don't want this pointing downward because the lumber will hit this and that could cause a mess right there. And my last step involves this little uh, rigid portable work support. I've had this thing for years. I've never used it for anything, I don't think. And this right here just helps keep the weight off of this hose. This hose is pretty heavy. And that takes a little bit of the weight off this connector and keeps it from sagging. So that right there, friends, is all there is to it. And then as far as the workflow goes, the lumber goes in this side and it comes out over there and then it goes on top of my cart. And that hose right there, friends, is totally out of the way. And when I'm done, I disconnect it, put it back on the motor, takes less than probably 15 seconds. And that keeps me from having to change bags on the planer like I used to over here with the Harbor Freight. Now that thing right there worked just fine. It just filled up really fast. And it also enables me to have one machine, that dust collector way up there for my jointer, the molder, and now the planer. Here's the other move that I made. The Hammer 16 inch jointer used to be right over there on the other side of the trash can and I moved it in here in the joiner room and I think that's gonna work out better. That same hose, I still got it hooked up to the planer, hooks up to that for dust collection so there's no problem there. And it makes a better workflow, I think. And I'm able to really utilize a lot more space by having it in this room. So we're gonna see how this goes. If I don't like it, I got two other ideas on places I may put it in here if this doesn't work out. I think maybe two weeks ago, I showed you guys putting up this poplar shiplap and I finished it the other day and the lighting is not the best in here, friends, but I think it turned out great. It has a natural finish. There's no oil, there's nothing on it, just the wood color and I think it looks really good. That's that nickel gap shiplap that we made about two weeks ago. I still need to put some trim right there on that corner, up there beside my cable tray, and also I need to trim out around the pipe right there. But other than that, this wall is pretty much done. And now, as soon as the doors get finished, I can take the Mr. Cool unit, which is waiting right there. That's the outside part and mount it right there on the wall. Right here is our project for the day. Well, there's mama too with us. Hello, mama. What are you doing down there? You wanna talk to us? And she's taking a bath. So anyways, this wall right here, friends, is what we're gonna be working on. First thing I need to do is take all this kiln dried lumber and move it out of the way and clean up the floor. And then we'll start putting our metal on this. Now, if you're wondering why I'm putting metal on this wall and not shiplap, there's a good reason. And stick around to the end of the video and I'll explain why. See what I did there? I'm making you guys watch the whole video. YouTube says if they watch the whole video, it would get pushed out better. So I've got to give a little incentive for you guys to stick around. And if you don't care, it don't cost you nothing, hit that thumbs up button below. I really appreciate it. Let's move this lumber out of the way and let's get started. that cleaned up it looks a lot better take a quick measurement right here 113 inches I need four runners to put horizontally on this wall to attach the metal to 
And I got some poplar over here that will work out just fine for that. I will skip plane it though before we install it. This poplar is right out of the kiln, so therefore the thickness is a little, you know, a little bit of variable right there in the thickness. So uh, I'm not sure what that was about, but I, anyways, you guys know what I'm saying. It came out of the kiln. The poplar is a little, uh, what the, what, what's the word I'm looking for here? My goodness. So the poplar came out of the kiln and the thickness is not uniform. That sounds a whole lot better. My goodness. It's been a long day, guys. I've been out the sun all day. So we'll skip plane that through the Grizzly planer to a true one inch. I think it's about five quarter on some of those boards. And I don't care how wide they are. They don't need to match because you're never gonna see them. I just need something to attach the metal to. And I also found something else we gotta work on before we put our little shop on this wall. We got some exposed closed cell insulation. This stuff right here is kind of flammable. And based on what we're gonna be doing over here, involves fire, hint. So we don't want any sparks coming over here and catching this stuff on fire. But I do have some pine shiplap over here on one of my carts and it should be more than enough to do this wall right here. All right, so in real time, see how long it takes me to hook up my collector or my hose rather to the Grizzly. Let's go ahead and trim off some of the fat and get these boards pretty close to the actual dimension. I'll leave about an inch and a half to trim these up after we run through the planer. First board ready to install, but before I put it on the wall, I'm gonna put this right here below it. That's an axe wedge, and that's gonna work as a shim to keep this poplar board about an eighth of an inch off the concrete. And the reason I'm doing that is this concrete has moisture in it. This poplar board is kiln dry, but it's not treated, of course. And if I can eliminate the contact between the board and the concrete, the lumber is going to last a whole lot longer. It's not going to try to absorb the moisture out of the concrete over time. And this may seem like overkill for a barn or a workshop, but it's good practice. And I am in an ever ending or a never ending battle for perfection. That's, that's my biggest, uh, I think my biggest flaw is I want everything to be as perfect as possible. And sometimes I just need to move on with things, but stuff like this, I think it's worth taking the extra time to do. Good old axe wedge. And that's poplar also. As soon as we install this board, I'll take these out and remove them. In the middle and on both ends. Use my pass load to nail these to the wall. One of my favorite tools. I almost forgot my level. Even though nobody's gonna see this, I want it to be level. A level. Looks pretty good right there. You guys hold your ears. This gun's kind of loud. Speaking of holding your ears, I need ear protection myself.
Out of bullets. I got the fourth runner on. That went up there on the very top. That's about 10 foot tall. And I failed to hit the record button, but it was more the same pretty much. Nothing exciting, just nailed it on with the pass load. But everything's lined up pretty good. It looks like we're ready for metal. But unfortunately, it's getting a little late, friends. It's about 10 o'clock. And to be honest with you, I'm tired. So I think we're gonna stop right here for the night and we'll come back tomorrow in the next video. We'll put the metal on, we'll put the ship lap on that one wall and cover up that insulation. And then we're gonna start moving our tools down here for this new workspace. So if you've stuck around to the end of this video, I guess I owe it to you to tell you what this new workspace is about. If you haven't guessed it by now, most of you probably already have, I'm gonna be doing some blacksmithing down here in this new workspace. Now that's something I've been interested in for, gosh, probably even before I got a sawmill, I've been interested in blacksmith work. Now I've done it a few times, but I've never done it on my own. I've been to a few different shops and played around with a power hammer and moved some metal around. I went to Jason Knight's shop about three years ago when we made a Bart Spud, but he done all the work. It was more or less just me getting to go to a real smith shop or a real blacksmith shop rather and uh, checking out all the tools and using a power hammer for the first time. Now I don't have a power hammer coming in, nothing like that. So here's my objective here for this. I have two anvils already. I have all the hammers that I think I need. I've got a lot of tongs and I have a forge. So I have everything I need to move metal and get my feet wet and see if I'm going to enjoy this new hobby that I'm venturing in. And here's my strategy over here. So this is not going to be permanent over here because this is a wood shop and wood and iron, especially hot iron and sparks don't mix together too well. And I've been told to try to keep them separate if you can. So here's my thinking on this. I'm building my doors here for the shop. And in order to complete those doors, I want to put some, uh, I guess you could call it some flat bar on the outside and kind of dress it up with a hammer and do some, uh, stuff I have in my head, some artistic stuff on the outside of the doors involving metal, and I can't do that without a forge and an anvil. So I'm going to set this up down here and uh, beat on some nails and beat on some iron and be honest with you guys, see if I enjoy this. So if I don't like this new hobby, and I think I will, I'll still have the tools down here to do it whenever I need to. I'll leave it set up on this wall over here, out of the way, and if I'm just banging on iron a couple of times a year, it's no big deal in a wood shop. It's not like I'm down here eight hours a day throwing sparks. But having said that, if it's something I really enjoy, and I think I will like it, because I've been doing a lot of reading, guys. I tell you, I've read more about blacksmithing in the past two years than most people have probably read their entire life. I've been researching it to death. So I think I'm going to really enjoy it. So, having said that, if I do enjoy this new hobby, I'll probably have a concrete pad poured down here somewhere near the timber frame and build a separate timber frame just for blacksmithing. So that's what we're going to be doing here, friends. In the next video, we're going to start setting this little shop up for blacksmithing. We'll do the walls. We'll start bringing some tools down and maybe start building the stand for the anvil. So uh, stay tuned, guys. That's coming up in the next few videos and a lot of saw milling. This is still a sawmill and channel. I'm just trying to share with you guys all the different interests that I have and blacksmithing has been on my mind for a long time and I've been acquiring all the necessary tools and it's time to start banging some iron and see if I enjoy it.